Good morning. My name is Rafael Espinal. I'm the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Today, the committee will be hearing testimony on intro bill number 52, sponsored by my colleague, Councilmember Cornegy. Intro 52 would ban companies that charge a fee for student debt relief that is already provided by the federal government. It would also offer a private cause of action for borrowers who fall victim to paying such unnecessary fees. Student loans have been an integral part of post-secondary education in America for more than 50 years. The Higher Education Act of 1985 established grant and scholarship programs for low-income students and provided low-interest loans to students, which helped to make college available for more, to more Americans. Over the years, the U.S. population with at least a bachelor's degree has grown almost exponentially. In 2017, more than 30% of the population has such a degree, which is double the amount from 1960. Unfortunately, however, the costs to attend college have also skyrocketed. It now costs 130% more to attend a private nonprofit college and 200% more to attend a four-year public institution compared to 20 years ago. These rising prices have also outpaced incomes to the point where the costs of higher education are now increasing eight times faster than wages. Given such factors, it is no wonder that student debt in this country is now the highest non-housing related debt. In the first quarter of this year, total student debt reached $1.52 trillion, the highest it's ever been. In New York City, there are approximately one million people with student loans, which is about 15% of the population. In total, these borrowers owe nearly $35 billion. While delinquency and default rates of these New Yorkers are slightly lower than the national average, student loan borrowers in the city continue to experience financial distress because of these loans. A 2017 report produced by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the city's Office of Financial Empowerment highlights the plight of student loan borrowers across the five boroughs. The research found that older borrowers, with those with smaller debts, and borrowers in low-income neighborhoods experience the highest loan distress. For example, there are more student loan borrowers in Harlem, Jamaica, and Queens Village who have defaulted on their loans than in any other neighborhood. Comparing the five boroughs, in the Bronx, 19% of student loan borrowers were 90 days past their payment dates, while in Brooklyn, the rate was 15%, which was still higher than the city average of 14%, while Queens, Manhattan, and Staten Island were all lower than the city average at 11 to 12%. Given these figures, it is no wonder that services offering debt relief are an attractive option for many New Yorkers. Companies may offer to help borrowers consolidate their loans, explore whether the borrower qualifies for debt forgiveness, or advise on how to limit monthly payments. For borrowers, following behind on payments, such as services might be as necessary as they are enticing. However, where student debt relief prov providers charge a fee for these services, the federal government offers the same services for free. According to the Federal Department of Education, there is nothing a student loan debt relief company can do for you that you can't do yourself for free. And the department offers a range of services at no cost to the borrower. Some borrowers may feel that paid service providers have student loan expertise or are better equipped to navigate the bureaucratic landscape of student loans. However, some student debt relief companies are running outright scams. Companies in New York and across the country have been charged with falsely advertising non-existent debt relief programs, charging illegal upfront fees, and falsely claiming to be affiliated with the Department of Education. When borrowers are exploited in this way, they get stuck paying for services they either don't use or qualify for and, call, and can fall even further behind on their loan payments. Some borrowers have been stopped paying, have have even stopped paying their student loans after engaging with the loan service providers because they incorrectly believed their debt responsibility had been seized. As a result, these borrowers now owe more, than, more on their debt because of missed payments. We look forward to hearing today from the administration, student borrowers, industry rep reps, and other interested stakeholders on their thoughts on how we can tackle and prevent such deceptive practices. Before I call on the administration, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined uh, by my colleague, Margaret Chin from Manhattan. Um, and with that said, uh, can you please administer the note? Yeah. Sure. 
do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Espinal. Good morning, Council Member Chin. Uh, my name is Lorelei Salas, and I am the Commissioner for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today on Intro 52-2018. A bill that would prohibit companies from charging a fee for student debt relief already provided without charge by the federal government unless specific disclosures are made and create create a private uh, cause of action for consumers harmed by violations of the law. I will first discuss DCA's recent work to identify the challenges impacting student loan borrowers and better protect and promote their financial health. DCA's mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. Fulfilling that mission requires us to reach out and listen to New Yorkers about the issues that affect their ability to control their financial lives and plan for their futures. Through that outreach work, we heard um, a lot about one issue that weighs on the minds and budgets of many New Yorkers, student loan debt. We decided to dig into this issue to learn more about how student loan debt affects average New Yorkers. In December 2017, DCA released a report, Student Loan Borrowing Across New York City Neighborhoods, in partnership uh, with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The report found that there are approximately one million student loan borrowers in New York City, and that 14% are approximately um, 90 days or more past due on their loans. Carrying student loan debt proves to be enormously consequential to individual and family financial health. For example, this debt reduces a borrower's ability to save for the future, build assets like home equity, and causes financial aid and emotional distress that can impact many aspects of a borrower's life. Strikingly, these effects hold true even for those borrowers who are current on their loan payments. The consequences are even more serious when a borrower enters delinquency and default. I just want to add that from personal experience, I. Um, I feel like this is an issue that, you know, it matters to me, not just because it's important to my agency's work, but I am, like many other New Yorkers, I went to school, put myself through school. I was able to not uh, accrue any debt while I attended public schools, uh, CUNY, but I then went on to get my law degree from a private university. By the time I graduated, I owed close to $150,000 in student loan debt. So that is a lot of money that, Honestly, it's not just about a financial hardship. It starts causing a lot of mental and physical stress to people. Um, and, um, and, you know, I care about this issue personally because I think it's important that we act on this and we do something about it now. Our 2017 report was just the first step to investigating the student loan debt problem in our city. At the beginning of this year, we put the findings from our report to work by launching student loan debt clinics to help New Yorkers understand their student loans and how to repay them. In partnership with Bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation, Phipps Neighborhoods Opportunity Center, and the New York Legal Assistance Group, DCA's Office of Financial Empowerment hosted clinics in Melrose in the Bronx and Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn two neighborhoods that our report identified as having high levels of student loan debt-related financial distress. At our clinics, trained professionals provided education, student loan literacy, and opportunities for financial and legal counseling. These clinics didn't just help New Yorkers, they also provided valuable lessons about the best way to educate and assist those struggling with student loan debt that DCA can carry forward and share with other organizations. To better understand how the consequences of student loan debt shaped the lives of New Yorkers, we needed to hear, that, uh, hear them tell their stories firsthand. We started with a series of events in neighborhoods that our report showed the highest rates of student loan delinquency and default, the South Bronx, Mount Eden and High Bridge in the Bronx, and East New York in Brooklyn. We employed a popular education model to develop conversations about student loan debt where we could both learn and inform. During those conversations, we heard from New Yorkers about obstacles to repayment, confusion about options, and the negative effects student loan debt can have on their lives. 
In June 2018, I chaired a public hearing called Speak Up, Speak Out, a public hearing about student loan debt in New York City. We heard testimony from members of the public, experts, advocates, and legal service providers about the serious and growing problem. Again, we heard um, about the many barriers to repayment success, including misrepresentations by schools, a lack of trusted and reliable information, and inadequate support for borrowers by student loan servicers contracted by the federal government to handle loan repayment. And of course, we heard uh, proposals for how governments at every level could help borrowers in New York City surmount these barriers and put themselves on a path to financial help and success. I am very grateful to everyone who participated in our hearing, and I look forward to sharing more about our findings and recommendations with the Council when our full hearing report is released later this fall. DCA Financial Empowerment Centers are a critical resource for New Yorkers who are struggling to navigate the student loan repayment process on their own. At our centers, professional financial counselors provide free one-on-one -on -one assistance with tackling debt, improving credit, creating and managing a budget, and saving and planning for the future. Counselors have received in-depth training on student loan issues and can help guide New Yorkers through the complex and sometimes confusing process of repaying student loans. There are more than 20 financial empowerment centers located across the five boroughs, and any New Yorker can schedule an appointment just by calling 311. Since 2014, our financial counselors have helped more than 1,100 clients take action related to their student loan debt including checking the status of their student loans, consolidating their student loans or payments, and or bringing their student loans out of default. Unfortunately, some actors seek to exploit students and borrowers for their own gain. Last week, I announced that DCA has filed a complaint in state court against Berkeley College, one of the largest for-profit colleges in New York State, with approximately 4,000 students alleging violations of the consumer protection law and debt collection rules. In addition to educating consumers, DCA is committed to using all the tools at our disposal to help companies who prey on the hopes and dreams of consumers seeking higher education accountable. Of course, it is important to recognize that student loan debt is a national but not just, and not just a New York City problem. According to recent reporting, total student loan debt in the United States is over $1.5 trillion, and students who earned bachelor's degrees in 2016 left school with an average debt load of $30,000. But the story doesn't end with students. Parents are also taking on increasing levels of student debt to help pay for their children's educations. The Federal Consumer Financial Pro uh, Protection Bureau has handled more than 60,000 complaints related to student loans since 2011. The student loan debt and its consequences do not fall evenly. In 2015, the research organization DEMOS found that despite having lower rates of college completion, young black households are far more likely to carry student loan debt than their white counterparts. Gender also plays a role um, Earlier this year, the American Association of University Women found that women hold nearly two-thirds of the outstanding student loan debt in the country, and many struggle to pay back their loans, likely due in part to the fact that women still learn, earn less than men on average. Tackling the student loan debt crisis is just as much about equity as it is about opportunity. DCA is committed to helping New Yorkers affected by student loan debt, and we look forward to partnering with the Council to do so. I will now turn to the bill before you today, Intro 52. Um, Intro 52 is intended to address one piece of the student loan debt problem by banning businesses from charging for services that are available free with a simple phone call to the Federal Department of Education or a borrower's loan servicer. Intro 52 would allow companies to continue charging for student loan debt relief services if they make certain disclosures about the availability of free services from the DOE. The bill would also create a civil right of action for consumers who are harmed by a company that fails to comply with the law. A complaint filed by Attorney General General um, Barbara Underwood last month vividly demonstrates the ways in which these companies can harass, deceive, and harm consumers. The complaint describes how companies 
both through advertising and in communication with borrowers, misrepresent the qualifications of their salespeople, the prices they charge, the results they can obtain for consumers, whether the company is affiliated with the government, whether a consumer can obtain a service on their own, and the programs for which a consumer is eligible. The complaint also alleges that the, these practices resulted in real consumer harm. For example, one consumer decided to take on thousands of dollars of debt to pursue a graduate degree because a student loan de debt relief company assured her she qualified for a forgiveness program that would wipe out her debt, when in fact she, um, she did not. Um, as a result, the consumer was left to figure out how to repay thousands of dollars in loans she counted on being forgiven for a degree she wouldn't have pursued if she'd known the truth. I commend the council for moving quickly to focus attentions, uh, attention on the problems caused by student loan debt relief companies. DCA supports the effort to prohibit these companies from charging for services available for free from the federal government. I would like to offer a few suggestions on the bill for the council's consideration. First, we're interested in hearing more from the council about how, why the broad safe harbor through disclosure is necessary and desirable. DCA understands that in some cases a consumer may wish to pay an experienced third party to help them navigate complex government programs, even if the services are available for free. However, the DOE itself warns the public about student loan debt relief companies, saying on its website that often these companies are charging for services you can easily manage yourself, and according to the Federal Trade Commission, there's nothing they can do for you that you can't do yourself for free. The FTC has acted against many of these companies and maintains a list of more than 400 entities that are banned from providing debt relief services. We hope to work with the council to refine the bill to strike an appropriate balance between the availability of services that are actually helpful to consumers and the prohibition of those that are harmful. Second, we suggest clarifying that DCA is authorized to pursue restitution on behalf of consumers uh, when we bring an enforcement action in an administrative tribunal. The bill already makes this remedy available to consumers who pursue a civil cause of action, and it would be helpful to make clear that these remedies are available in agency actions taken pursuant to these provisions as well. Not just helpful, it's actually necessary. Um, finally, if the disclosure safe harbor remains in the bill, the council should consider requiring that the disclosure be signed by consumers and a copy retained by the student loan debt relief services company. The bill should also create a rebuttable presumption that a company did not provide um, the disclosure if they are unable to produce a copy signed by the consumer. These requirements will create a record showing that consumers received and acknowledged the document and will help DCA hold them accountable. Thank you for the opportunity to offer comments on Intro 52. We look forward to working with the Council as this bill moves forward uh, through the legislative process. Um, the Law Department is still reviewing the proposal. Um, and again, thank you for the opportunity to offer insight into the work that DCA is doing on this very, very important uh, and critical issue that is student loan debt. Um, so I am here happy to answer any questions and I'm joined also by my colleague, um, Casey Adams, who is DCA's Director of City Legislative Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Brad Lander from Brooklyn and Peter Koo from Queens. Um, so thank you for your testimony. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all the work DCA is doing. Uh, to, to help uh, those student, those that have student loans uh, with the relief they need and the support they need uh, to get on track and making sure they don't fall behind in their payments. So I just want to flesh out more on the safe harbor uh, comment you made. So you, you believe that th there shouldn't be any safe harbor for, for anyone that's, that's charging uh, for debt relief services? We believe that there are some cases in which um, individuals are actually receiving incidental assistance with uh, accessing some of these services as part of a larger package of financial advice, maybe. In some cases, you may engage with a, a financial planner who may be assisting you also to, to figure out what your debt looks like and what kinds of programs you 
qualify for, right? In those cases, maybe it makes sense to to uh, to allow them to continue to offer those services, but we do think that the language right now is so broad that um, it needs refining. And I think that we are we're looking forward to hearing more from the council and from advocates today about um, how these relationships shake out in practice, so that we can strike that appropriate balance. Yeah, I personally agree with you. Uh, you know, th these are free services; they exist. Uh, I think consumers uh, should should sought at, should look for those free services and be more aware that they're available. They should not pay, be paying folks for services the government's offering for free. Uh, and I think we, we look, we, we've had similar conversations, especially around like immigration services, right? And people paying for these services that possibly they can get free from uh, government agencies or, or offices as well. So I personally agree, and it's something I, I will bring back to the bill sponsors as well. Um, I thought it was a good point. So thank, thank you. you. Um, I guess my next question is, uh, can you go deeper into uh, what the process is like for someone who who has uh, student uh, loan debt, and what can they, what 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 services the DCA offer? Like, oh, walk me through the process. So, if I'm having issues paying my bills, um, and I see on DCA's website that you offer some sort of services, uh, I call three one one or and, yes. And so, can you walk me through that? Yes, definitely. For anyone that's listening, that that probably needs help and sure. wants to know where they can go. Yes, so as you are aware, uh, our office, DCA, has been hosting the Office of Financial Empowerment for close to or over a decade already. And this office's mission is really to focus on improving the financial health of New Yorkers. So we manage, we offer financial counseling, financial coaching one-on-one -on -one in New York City to all New Yorkers, regardless of income and immigration status. Uh, we have over 20 financial empowerment centers across the city. And as you said, it's very simple to access our services. You can call 311. Um, you can also, I believe we can visit our website. You can text us. Um, and I'll get you the, the I think it's, you can text, uh, you will get the, the text number. Um, but it's super simple to, to access us. Um, the moment you call us, you will be guided to the financial empowerment center that are closest to you, to where you live or where you work. Uh, our services are available in different languages. The counselors um, have language capacity, cultural cultural capacity to, to serve individuals from different immig immigrant communities. Um, they are well trained, they are professional, and they are there to really handhold you as you think about creating a budget, tackling your debt, um, improving your credit score. And as I mentioned in my testimony, just a few weeks ago, we held an intensive training for the counselors to give them even more um, specialized uh, skills on handling uh, issues like student loan debt so they can better guide New Yorkers as they're trying to, to address this, this, this issue. So it's, it's free financial counseling. Yes. And how to get you out of underwater. Absolutely free. Um, there are some existing um, loan repayment, loan forgiveness programs that um, we are, you know, will be able to help people access. Um, but we also want to start early, right? We want to meet with parents who are considering saving for college. We want to meet with aspiring students to make sure that they understand how to weigh their options as they make these really important decisions. These like basically life-changing decisions because once you are buying an education, you are um, really, um, you're, you may end up in debt for a long time. And so we want people to make the right, um, the right decisions for themselves. And the text number, you can text talk money to 42033 and you'll be able to get an appointment with a financial counselor. Can you repeat that again? Talk money to 42033, that's the number you text, right? And as well, council member, we should say that we, uh, in addition to the individualized help that we do, we also leverage all the knowledge that we gain. Uh, so if, for example, we have a tip sheet here for student loan borrowers, which I believe all of you should have um, as part of your packet. So we are, uh, we're committed to not only providing that individualized assistance, but in some of what you heard in our testimony and with that document there, those are examples of us deploying that to help people who haven't yet come in for a financial uh, empowerment center appointment. I would also add that um, as you referred to our research report and I also mentioned that we are using our findings to really target our services to those communities that need them most, right? So it really has been very important for us to be able to, to do this work, to get the data and then to really think about where we can put our resources so that we are really serving the most vulnerable New Yorkers. 
Can, can you speak to uh, the federal program that um, absolves student, uh, student, student debt if they work for government for 10 years? Have you, have, have you worked in, in, with, with folks that, that, that fall in, in, that, in that paradigm? Um, so what, what I can tell you is that w what we've been learning through the work that we are doing, both in doing advocacy, doing research, and thinking about potential programs that we could even make available in the city, right? Um, I, it is, it's a, um, the public uh, service loan forgiveness program is, is, is available, it's still, still standing today, and we're you know, fighting to make sure it continues. Uh, but it's definitely, it's received a lot of public attention right now because it can be confusing to access that uh, program. And, um, and there have been people who have tried, who thought they were in, in, enrolled in the program and they weren't. Um, and so we are internally thinking about tools that can be useful for people to, to be able to really access this kind of relief. There is that um, federal program, but in addition to that, I have to say there are a number of other programs, even in New York State, that go towards loan forgiveness for specific professions like teachers um, and other professions. And uh, people with disabilities also can uh, get their entire loans forgiven. And so we are really trying to put together materials that would capture all of these um, opportunities that people are not necessarily taking advantage of. Okay, well thank you. I mean, it's no secret, uh, student loans debt is, is the biggest financial crisis that millennials are facing. And for that reason, uh, a lot of folks in my generation uh, probably would never be able to own a home probably will never be able to get underwater and, and, and live the so-called American dream that we try to provide here. So, uh, you know, I appreciate all the work you're trying to do and I would love to continue working together to make sure that we figure out ways where we can continue providing relief uh, for, for those folks. Thank you. I'll just volunteer that uh, we are in the process of publishing a second report um, in the next couple of weeks or so um, that looks a little more in, in depth at the the reasons why people end up um, not completing their degrees and end, end up in collections. Um, I can tell you preliminarily that one indicator uh, that we're finding in those neighborhoods where there are high rates of uh, people in collections is that they attended or enrolled in a for-profit school. And I would be happy to have my research team present to the committee at some point on, on our research, the data we've gathered, and uh, help you you know, uh, understand uh, the information we have that you can then use um, as you think about idea solutions for this problem. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions from my colleagues. I would like to call up uh, Council Member Chin. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. This is such a critical, important issue, especially in immigrant community and in low-income community. And every time you know, I ride the train, you see all these advertisements, uh, all these like, college program that attracts people. And a lot of immigrants don't even know, you know what they're walking into. Um, I worked for a community college many years ago. And I see that you know, the problem, some of the students, when they transfer and they uh, mm -hmm. sign up for these yeah. uh, private colleges, um, that they thought they will be able to get their degree and unfortunately, some of them don't, and then they end up with money that they have to pay back. Um, so what you're doing is great at DCA. Uh, my question is, like, how do, we, how do you get that information out there? Because like, you're not on the subway, you know, in the yeah. car, subway cars, mm -hmm. advertisement. Mm -hmm. All these other you know, private college, they are. Um, so how yeah. would someone even you know, get those information yeah. I know that you do a lot of outreach, but how do you sort of like get to people mm -hmm. um, and really so that they could have the tools and the information mm -hmm. to make right decision? And then you were talking about parents. So are you at college fairs? Are you getting this information to our local high school, mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. center? Mm -hmm. How is DCA getting the information out that there's help available, there's all these resources that can help yeah, thank you for the question. It's, it's a great question. And um, I have to say, you're absolutely right. We cannot compete with the kind of money that these schools invest in advertising. In fact, you know, it's, it's very well documented that for-profit schools, for instance, spend much more money in advertising and recruitment than they do in the education itself. And that's part of the problem. 
Um, so we are, yes, it is, it's a struggle, right? We don't have the kinds of dollars that they do to be able to put in a, a huge public awareness campaign, a, a, one that is up there all the time, right? Um, but we are, um, just a few days ago, filed a lawsuit against uh, Berkeley College. Um, we tried to use every opportunity for earned media to make sure that people know that we are here to take on those complaints and to address those practices. Um, we're certainly doing a lot of the work that we can um, outside of um, marketing. We are working with the Department of Education, New York City Department of Education. We're thinking about ways in which we can um, come up with policies that make sense, that are protective of our students, right? We are also always in conversations with CUNY, um, and it's, it's a work in progress. I, I can tell you that our teams are um, out there doing uh, like workshops in communities, in, especially, like I said, in those neighborhoods where we see high rates of default and delinquencies on student loan debt. We're hosting workshops and know you right trainings, uh, listening sessions. Um, I think that there's more that we can do and we're hoping to um, bring back a public awareness campaign that will help people like think about the flags and the kinds of questions they need to ask before they actually sign those contracts and enroll in some schools where they're really, you know, they're, they're investing a lot of money and they will not get a whole lot back from them. Um, so it is something that we will be happy to continue to talk to you about. Um, and uh, if you have ideas for us, certainly, if you, have, if you think, can think of places that we should go to, please let us know. But the tools that we're coming up with will be in different languages. We'll do what we can to blanket the city with this information. We have held to date, I would say, at least three to four days of action where we have gone to um, just subway um, stations and stood in the corners giving information on student loan debt. I have to say it is probably the most type of, a, the most successful type of day of action because most people just walk by because they're busy, right, in, in a rush to get to work or to school. But when they hear student loan debt, they come back to us and they take the information. Because it's, if it's not them, it's their children, it's their cousin, it's their neighbor. Uh, so there is a lot of need, and we welcome any ideas you may have for how we can even build on, upon this and make sure that people do know about the services that are available. Well, definitely, I mean, I think the city council, all the council members would love to work with you. Uh, make sure that those information are out there in the community. Every time we do family days or it's my park days, we should get those information out. So mm -hmm. if you could reach out to our offices with the, the mm -hmm. many different languages, um, that would be helpful because we want to help get the word out because these are resources that's free and they are able to help these families. So we want to make sure that people take care of the, the student, you know, that issue because private company are advertising on TV, you don't know if they're real or not, if they, even though they say free service. Mm -hmm. So the city, you know, if you put together a list, you know, of all the resources that are available and we can help, you know, circulate. And the other thing that I uh, would encourage you to continue to do uh, is to really utilize community media, ethnic media to get the word out and to kind of promote the good work that DCA is doing on this issue. Mm -hmm. When you file a lawsuit against that private college, that should be out in the local media, in the ethnic mm -hmm. media. I want to read about it in, in local Chinese paper, right? So right. this way, I think we can all help to get mm -hmm. the word out. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, I'd like to call up Councilmember Bradlander. Thanks, Mr. Chair, for convening this hearing and uh, Commissioner for all the work DCA is doing on this really uh, critical issue. Um, and thanks also for your suggestions on how we can strengthen the legislation, which I agree is important and I'm going to sign on to as a co-sponsor, but I, I want to explore a couple of the issues that you raised around safe, safe harbor and what we might do uh, to strengthen this further. And I, I guess I'd love to understand a little better who, uh, who we think is dominating this field. Um, and uh, understand a little better whether there are some actors that maybe shouldn't have the right to do it at all, even with Safe Harbor. Um, uh, you know, I know that you cite, you know, you, you bring this action against Berkeley College, like may, maybe that's a place that shouldn't have the right to do it. Um, 
mm -hmm. I've noticed that in some other states, the, in the committee report that our staff put together, that some states have, have moved to student loan service licensing requirements to try to you know, require that only good actors are doing it. I feel like the challenge with a safe harbor is just if one more form, even with your good suggestion about rebuttable presumption, like here you have to sign this form before you get our help is the nature of the problem often in the student loan services to begin with, like having people sign disclosures mm -hmm. that they're nominally understanding that they had other options than is often just kind of part of the paperwork, especially as Councilmember Chin says, you know, with folks who, for whom English is not their first language. So can you give us a little better sense of kind of the, the bad actors we're trying to combat here and whether there would be other ways through licensing or through prohibition of groups even having the safe harbor to get at, making sure we're not leaving folks vulnerable. I, I appreciate Councilmember Chin's uh, request and your work for even more outreach for what's available publicly, but it's hard to compete with people advertising who are making money through bad acts and are able to target particular niche communities with a profit-seeking motive. So, you know, as addition to reaching out further, I do feel like understanding and shutting down the bad actors is important. Thank you for your question, uh, Council Member Lander. Um, so a couple of things. Um, I just want to clarify that um, what is um, the issue you referred to that is happening in other localities and states of, around um, licensing servicers, it's, 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 it's different from what this bill is trying to do, right? Because servicers are actually contracted with the Department of Education to provide a lot of this, uh, the servicing of the loans, right? Um, so they are different from the debt relief um, services that the bill is actually targeting. Um, and we are certainly interested in, in looking at servicers issues and, and would love to continue to talk about that. Um, but with respect to, to who the bad actors are, I have to say honestly, we don't have a lot of information on that at DCA. Uh, we don't have a lot of complaints in our office on that, that particular issue, and we really are here to learn more about that. We would love to hear from the advocates about who they are. I mean, I just yesterday got a phone call from one of these companies saying, um, if you don't enroll within the next 72 hours, you miss your chance forever, and we have this great package to offer you. Press two, I press two, and I get connected to someone just to find out. And I said, so tell me more about this. And they hung up on me. It, so I, I didn't get very far. I appreciate that you were doing undercover research. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I will never like, lose, miss an opportunity to try to do that. Uh, but it's certainly something that I think, you know, it's not just me. I mean, I, I go around my office. My colleagues are getting those calls. That is happening. Um, we'd love to like, talk more with the people who are getting those complaints um, so we can explore how we can go after them. But we do think that you know, they are covered by the consumer protection law, right? If you are operating in New York City, we can use our existing law to go after them. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, we could, I mean, I, I get that the people providing, uh, you know, uh, debt relief services are different from the loan servicers. If we thought there was a big problem with those folks who are providing this, providing this information, we, th we could you know, have a licensing requirement for them. We probably should understand better, you know, as you are saying, what the nature of the problem is before we would jump at that solution. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you for this information, and I'm gonna sign on to the legislation, and we'll follow up, and I think uh, hopefully work to make some of the changes that you're proposing here. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. Any other questions from my colleagues? No? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. Appreciate Thank it. I look so forward much. to continuing working with you on this issue. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good day. I'm going to call the second panel. It's the final panel. Uh, we have Ayana Robertson and Mary McCoon from Brooklyn Legal Services. We have Daniel Tarantolo from the New York Legal Assistance Group. And Jordan Rosenthal from the College and Community Fellowship. Okay, 
Yeah, feel free to begin. Good morning. I'd like to thank the chair and the city council for its leadership on this issue and allowing us to testify here today. My name is Ayana Robertson and I am the associate director at Brooklyn Legal Services, a program of Legal Services NYC, the largest provider of civil legal services in the country. For 50 years, Legal Services NYC has provided critical legal services to low-income New York City residents. We assist over 600 New York City residents with consumer debt issues annually, and about 20% of those individuals seek help with student loan debt. In our practice, we found that student loan debt relief agencies prey on borrowers over the age of 60, young people with limited financial literacy, and those already in financial distress. For example, one of our clients consulted with an agency that charged her a fee for simply creating a password to access a free government website. We commend the City Council for seeking to protect these individuals and believe there are several best practices that may enhance the proposed bill. The proposed disclosure requirement allows debt relief agencies to bury the disclosure in fine print or to write it in a way that's unclear or ambiguous. If the disclosure were a standalone document in large font, it would increase the probability that borrowers would both see and read the notice. Similar notices have been successful in the foreclosure context and in consumer credit cases. In addition, if the disclosures contain statutorily required language and were presented in the preferred language of the individual, it would ensure that the notices are clear and consistent, and those with limited English proficiency are afforded the same level of protection as other consumers. We have also seen success where the disclosures have included a list of additional free resources or a reference to 311. Finally, increasing the penalties for violations would serve as a deterrent to potential scammers. Given the profit potential realized by these debt relief agencies, a $500 fine would have a limited impact, but disgorgement of profits and civil fines may serve as a larger deterrent. Together, we believe these enhance enhancements would provide much needed safeguards to those New Yorkers who, already, who are already struggling with student loan debt. We thank the City Council for its continued work to protect consumers and giving us the opportunity to comment on Intro 52. I'm joined by my colleague, Mary McCune, who is a senior staff attorney in our Manhattan office, who can speak more to student loan debt. I'm just going to say a few words because I know there are others that have things to say. Um, one of the experiences that my clients... Can you uh, state your name for the record? Oh, sure. Sorry. I was just... Mary McCune, Manhattan Legal Services, the Harlem office. Uh, a large number of my clients have student loan debt. Uh, one of the things that the disclosure that is proposed includes is a referral to the Department of Education Services. And in our experience, people often get inaccurate information from the servicers themselves, and that is problematic. For example, I have a client who is, became disabled, has heavy student loan debt, contacted the servicer, and was told she wasn't eligible for a discharge, even though she was, and her only income was Social Security at that point. So we think that in itself is not sufficient, and what we would propose to make the disclosure stronger is to include a reference to 311, uh, the Financial Empowerment Center. We actually host one of the offices in Harlem, and they just do um, amazing work, and they're great at advocating for people that don't know their rights, and ensuring that they get the discharges they're entitled to. They also look at the complete financial health of the individual, because if you have student loan debt, you probably have other debt too. So focusing just on the student loan debt doesn't always take care of all the problems. Um, so that's basically all I had to add, and I'll pass it on to my next colleague. Chair Espinal, council members and staff, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Danielle Tarantolo, and I am a co-director of the Special Litigation Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Group, a legal services organization that assists student loan borrowers as well as countless other low-income New Yorkers. As the committee is aware, New Yorkers with crushing student loan debt make easy targets for student debt relief scammers. These companies routinely make false misrepresentations to induce borrowers to sign up for their services including that the companies can provide complete loan forgiveness, which they cannot do. They also conceal that the programs they offer are all available for free from the borrower's loan servicers. And these scammers charge exorbitant fees, around $1,300 for many custom consumers that we've spoken to. 
To make matters worse, many of the companies work closely with predatory financing companies, which loan customers the exorbitant purchase price at usurious interest rates, further compounding the harm to the borrowers. We commend the Council for considering this ban on the provision of these predatory services and strongly endorse the bill's provision for financial penalties and a private cause of action for enforcement. We, like others who have spoken today, have concerns, however, that allowing companies to evade the prohibition by providing written disclosures risks undermining the bill's important effects. If allowed to, these scammers will simply bury the so-called disclosure in fine print within a massive pile of documents and then pressure the customers to sign the documents under extreme time pressure. We would recommend removing the safe harbor provision altogether. But if it remains, at a minimum, we suggest that the bill require the disclosures to be made in large font on a separate page that appears first in any packet of materials provided that, and that the bill require initials ne next to each individual disclosure as well as a full signature on a line directly below the disclosures. The bill should also require that the disclosures be provided orally in addition to in writing because in our experience, many of these companies make whatever representation is necessary over the phone to induce someone to sign, even if those representations are contradicted in written documents that are later provided to the customer. With these changes, the bill would go much further towards providing the protections that New York City consumers deserve. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to share these comments. Hi, my name is Jordan Rosenthal, and I feel like that's all been a really tough act to follow. Um, but anyway, good morning, Chairperson Espinal and members of the City Council Committee on the Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. My name is Jordan Rosenthal, and I'm the Senior Associate of Policy and Advocacy at College and Community Fellowship, and I'd like to thank you for holding this hearing um, and allowing public testimony in regards to Introduction 52. College and Community Fellowship is a nonprofit that partners with women with criminal convictions to help them earn college degrees so they, their families, and their communities can thrive. Our direct service work is holistic and comprehensive approach to supporting women with criminal convictions in receiving their college degrees. This includes education regarding funding streams for college, student loans, and student loan debt management. We began tracking data about student loans in 2014, and in that time, we've helped 232 women earn degrees. The total number of student debt for this, these women since we started tracking is almost $4 million. Thanks to our counseling scholarship and existing Pell and TAP grants, 117 out of the 232 did not need additional FAFSA funding. For those who did, the average cost was about $34,706. Our work on education has shown us that education is a crucial, crucial strategy to sustainability, ensuring that people are not siloed into poverty. However, education is becoming increasingly difficult to finance. Current research predicts that if national trends around student loan debt continue, 40% of borrowers may default on their loans by 2030. Our work has also shown us that it is possible to design and implement supports that keep people from defaulting. For instance, when people actually go are arrested and are sentenced to prison, they can put their loans on forbearance. That doesn't always happen, and that's a huge major, major financial cost for that individual. Um, also, our work has shown us that nearly 38% of all black first-time college entrants in and 2004 had defaulted within 12 years, a rate three times as higher than their white counterparts. This is not due to some immutable characteristic of race, but rather the historically discriminatory policies that have made it difficult for communities of color to amass wealth. As a result, currently, the average white family holds 10 times the wealth of the average black family, and the likelihood of default in high is higher in black populations because marginalized populations lack the resources, both financially and the education required to navigate finances. Um, basically, as a result, a lot of our women don't fall predatory to these services because we provide counseling 
on how to navigate this bureaucratic system. I've talked to several of our academic counselors and women have gotten these calls. I've gotten these calls myself and they seem really enticing. These are also women that are re-entering home, which is one of the most vulnerable time periods of their life. Granted, you may not have to have access to paying your loans while you're in school, but if you don't have the financial literacy or the understanding of how the system works, you may fall victim to one of these services. Um, on a like kind of separate note, as an individual myself who has over six figures of student debt from two years of graduate school, I could fall victim to that. And to speak earlier to what someone was saying about public service loan forgiveness, a recent study showed 99% of those who submitted their paperwork for public service loan forgiveness were told they did not qualify and meet the standards. There's a huge problem completely across the board, and vulnerable communities and individuals who are already strapped for money are even higher targets for this. We must ban these industries. We already like direct our women away from for-profit colleges. Actually, we won't let them go to them. We will not support them. And this has to happen across the board. There's already federal legislation introduced by Brian Schatz, the REAL Act and the PREP Act, that start to standardize these programs and access to financial resources, including Pell. We can make this next step to serve the vulnerable populations, and education is the highest, or the best way for um, climbing like the ladder, so to speak, and, but we need to put those protections in. If the whole point is education is to, supposed to make us stronger and healthier, we can't let people fall victim to these bad actors. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your powerful testimony. I appreciate it. Um, uh, you all brought up great points that I, I agree with, and we're going to further look into the bill and see how we can strengthen it to make sure that no one feels that they need to depend on these services or even fall victim to these services. So thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else here to testify? No? All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> we do things quickly here in the... <laughs> Committee on Consumer Affairs, but uh, thank you all uh, for tuning in. And again, if you uh, need help and you're looking for assistance, you can go to the Department of Consumer Affairs, call 311, or visit the website. With that said, this meeting is adjourned.